What are patent claims? The claims of a patent application or an issued patent are the most important part. And it's a term that people use incorrectly typically and that people don't a lot of times know what the claims are. So stick around, we're gonna give you all the information we are starting right now. So for those of you who are new here, my name is Dylan Adams. I'm a patent attorney and author of the best-selling book, Patents Demystified, which is an insider's guide to protecting ideas and inventions used by inventors, entrepreneurs, and startups worldwide, including at top universities like Harvard, Stanford, and MIT. You might also recognize me from my appearance on CNBC's hit show, The Profit, with Marcus Lemonis. So this channel is all about giving you insider tips on protecting ideas and inventions that I use every day with my clients, whether they be Fortune 100 companies, startups, or even Shark Tank companies. So be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that little bell icon so you don't miss any videos. All right, let's go ahead and get right into it. So as I said, patent claims are the most important part of patent applications and issued patents because that's what the examination process is all about and claims are how you determine whether infringement is present or not present. Okay, so let's step back for a second. Claims define the meets and bounds of what actually is protected in a patent. It's not the drawings, it's not the specification or the description, it's only the claims. The claims are the only thing that defines what is protected and what's not. And that's why during the examination process, the whole battle is over the claims. Okay, so most people look at a patent application and they're gonna look at the drawings and assume that everything in the drawings is protected by the patent. That is completely untrue. Similarly, people will look at the description and they'll read through it and they'll say, oh yeah, everything in this, that's protected by the patent. Absolutely not untrue. It's only the claims that define what is actually protected and what's not. And surprisingly, a lot of times it's only going to be a, a small subset of what's actually in the drawings or described in the description or specification that is actually protected. And the way you find out what is actually protected, that is by reading and understanding the claims. So if the claims are so important, where are they in a patent application or issued patent and how do you find them? So like I said, it's not the drawings and it's not the specification. The whole description, that's not the claim section. And that's one thing that a lot of times people say is they, they look at the description and they call those the claims. The specification only provides support for the claims, which are, it's a little section at the end of a published patent application or issued patent and the claims are strangely worded single sentences. A lot of times there's gonna be around 20 or so. Sometimes, sometimes there can be less, sometimes there can be more, but it's gonna be these numbered sentences. Each sentence, you know, like a typical sentence is going to start with a capital letter and it will end with a period. All claims are required to do that. Um, it's gonna start, start with a number. Um, and unlike the paragraph numbers, so in a published patent application, you're gonna have paragraph numbers. It's not the paragraph numbers. These are gonna be numbered from say one to 20, assuming there's 20 claims. Um, and you know, it's not like the, the column numbers in an issued patent. It's not gonna be um, you know, the column numbers or it's not gonna have anything to do with the, with the line numbers. It's the numbered sentences at the very end of the patent application or, or the issued patent. Those are what the claims are. And those, that, like I said, those are the only things that define what the meets and bounds of the patent application or issued patent are. To better understand patent claims and why they're so important, let's first start talking about the patent examination process. So when you file a non-provisional patent application at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, one of the parts of the application that is required is having patent claims. Now to step back, it's important to understand that patents aren't just a binary thing and claims are not just a binary thing. It's not just having a patent and not having a patent. Claims can provide a spectrum of protection. They can be really broad and cover a lot of different variations, or they can be really narrow and super specific so they really cover only one very, very specific thing that is impossible to infringe. So let me kind of explain that a bit more. So a broad patent, that has broad claims covers a lot of different variations. So it'll hopefully cover the product that you have, but a lot of different variations of that. So that if a competitor comes in and does something different and makes some changes to it, hopefully that still is going to infringe that patent, right? So it's not easy for someone to come in and 
do something different or maybe try to design around your patent, they would have to design around it so that it's, you know, their product isn't as good or that they can't even get into the field. That's what a good broad patent does. And that all depends on the patent claims and how they're worded. So on the other end of the spectrum, you can have a patent with claims that is worded so specifically and so narrow that maybe it doesn't even cover what you're actually doing and is so specific and so narrow that it would be unlikely for somebody to ever do something like that and actually infringe or that they would then be able to uh, design around it and make little tiny tweaks or changes to what you're doing or to compare to what the cl patent claims require so they could easily not infringe the patent. So that's what really is important about protection with claims is you know it's, it's not just getting a patent or not. Honestly, a lot of times getting an issued patent, that's the easy part. What's difficult is getting a patent application through to make it an issued patent that has claims that are really broad and cover a lot of different variations. And that's a lot of the benefit that a patent attorney is gonna to give to you. Patent attorneys know how to do the negotiation of the examination process to get you the broadest claims possible. Again, the purpose really is not just to get an issued patent. That's, like I said, typically easy. Um, you can go in and try to get some super narrow claims. Hey, not a problem, that's usually fairly doable. What's hard is getting a broad uh, patent with broad claims that cover a lot of different variations. So let's kind of talk about the examination process and how that works. So like I said, you file a patent application and it has claims in it. And then you, you uh, wait in line for say one to three years when the patent examination process begins. So a patent examiner after one to three years will pick up the examination and do what's called a prior art search where the examiner is gonna look at what the claims are and determine whether the claims as you have them as presented are new and non-obvious compared to the prior art. And essentially what the examiner is gonna do is gonna look at all the elements that you have in the claims and say, hey, is there one single piece of prior art that shows all of these elements that you have in the claims? Or maybe I can't find one single piece of prior art that shows that, but can I find one or two or maybe three or four different pieces of prior art and take the elements from those and come to the same elements that you have in your claims? And I would say 95% of the time, there are gonna be rejections uh, in the examination process. And that is a standard and expected part of the examination process. And that's another thing to keep in mind is that the examination process is a lot like a negotiation. So think of it almost like, uh, like a show like Pawn Stars or American Pickers where you have somebody who is a seller and you have somebody who is a buyer. And there's a negotiation where the, the, the seller comes in and usually they're gonna ask for a price that is just way too high. And maybe it's the Pawn Stars folks. They say, well, no, we could never offer you that, but we would offer you this. Ideally, there's a negotiation and both parties kind of work towards a price that they can both agree on and then a sale is made. And that's very analogous to the way the patent examination process is. It's good to go in with claims that are broader than what you expect to actually be able to get. So then the examiner can frame the issues and then you can only add the elements that are absolutely necessary to get over that hurdle of patentability. That is, you know, making it clear to the examiner that what you have claimed is new and non-obvious over the prior art. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a good thing to have some negotiation because that's how you get the broadest claim scope possible. So just like any negotiation, there may be a lot of different rounds of back and forth with a patent examiner. You go in with your initial claims, the patent examiner forms rejections and sends them to you in what's called an office action. You, ha you can argue against the rejections or amend the claims to add elements or change things to try to get over the rejections. And then the examiner goes back and will do another prior art search and try to determine whether what you've added or what you've argued is actually new and non-obvious. And that process may go back and forth a few times. Hopefully, at some point, you convince the examiner that what you have claimed is new and non-obvious compared to the prior art. And I have some videos on what that examination process is like um, that gets into more detail on that. But um, for the scope of you know this, this video, let's just kind of hope that you get to the point where the examination process, um, you know, the examiner says, hey, this is allowable, allows the case, you pay an issue fee, and then the application issues as a patent. That's when the claims are actually set in stone. So during the pending application process, um, you know, you don't actually have enforceable rights. And that's because the claims aren't solidified. When you initially file the application, the claims you start with almost certainly are not going to be the claims that you end up with. And it's only the claims of an issued patent that actually define what infringement is. And that's something to keep in mind is you may see publication, uh, publications of pending applications, but those pending claims, those may change during examination and those claims aren't enforceable. It's only an issued patent 
that you can actually infringe and you have to make a determination whether infringement is present or not. So when it comes to infringement of an issued patent, the way you determine whether infringement is present or not present is through an analysis of, a, of the claims to the product. Okay, so let me kind of walk through what that looks like. So, so to infringe a patent, you have to infringe at least one of the claims. And like I said, there's typically going to be around 20, sometimes there's less, sometimes there's more, but you just need to infringe one claim in order for there to be infringement of the patent. Okay, so how do you do that analysis? And one of the things that really trips people up is a lot of times they're going to look at the drawings and assume that everything is protected there, look at the description and assume that everything is protected there. And that's the comparison they do. And that's completely wrong. It's only the claims that define the meets and bounds of what is actually protected. So for each claim, you need to determine whether all of the elements of that claim are met by the product. And let me give an example of that. So let's say there's a patent claim and it says um, a, a product that has elements A, B, C, and D. Okay. So then what you'll do is you'll look at the product and say, hey, does this product have element A? Yes or no. Does it have element B? Yes or no. Does it have element C? Yes or no. Does it have element D? Yes or no. And if you say yes to all of those different elements of the claim, then infringement is present. But let's say you have a product and it only has elements A, B, and D. Element C is missing. Well, then there wouldn't be infringement because there has to be all of the elements in of the claim being met for there to be infringement. Okay. So what about if you have elements A, B, C, and D? E and F. Well, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's E or F or Z or X or whatever. As long as the product has the elements A, B, C, and D, doesn't matter what else there is. As long as those minimal things are met, then there is infringement. So that's the important thing to understand about patents. It's looking at the claims and looking at the elements of the claims. That's how you determine patentability. Sure, the description may give you some general idea of what the claims mean. The drawings may also give you some idea of what the claims mean. But there are plenty of cases where you know people have come to me and said, oh yeah, I, I know that there is an infringement present. I looked at the drawings. Our, you know, our product has, you know, doesn't look anything like those drawings. But if you look at the claims, the claims are worded in such a way that they're kind of broader than what the drawings show, and infringement would actually be present. On the other hand, people say, oh, you know, I looked at the drawings in, in this patent and they look really close to what I'm doing. I think infringement is present and either I need to stop, you know, selling my product or I need a license or something. But if you look at the elements of the claims, they're really, really specific and require a lot of things that aren't in the person's product. And so otherwise, if they hadn't done the analysis of the claims and just look at the drawings or just look at the description, they would have come to the wrong conclusion that infringement is actually present. So that's the important thing about claims to understand. They define the meets and bounds of what is actually protected. And typically, it, it's, a, it's a subset of what is actually uh, described in the description and drawings, although sometimes it can be you know, seemingly broader than that. But at the same time, the claims have to be supported by the specification of drawings. You, just can't, you can't have something that's completely different. So that is claims and why they're important. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more on patents and startups. Give it a like if you got some value out of this video. Uh, 